Right, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Life Technologies for the opportunity to, uh, to come to, uh, to the AMP and uh, present our data. Uh, I'd like to start with a, with a story about, about a professor at, uh, at Harvard. His name is Clayton Christensen. Uh, some of you might know him, and he coined the term disruptive innovation. Uh, very interesting term, so basically means that, that, that you have a, a, a company offering a service or product that um, very, few, very few people are aware of, and they uh, offer uh, uh, at the same, uh, uh, the same level of, of uh, uh, service or better level of service than the competitors, and at a lower cost or lower price point. So you, there you have it, there is someone coming in new to the market, offering something uh, for a cheap, uh, cheaper way and a higher quality. That's disruptive innovation in a nutshell. So we believe that, that this is a great example of disruptive innovation. This is a PCI in uh, HER2 and in breast cancer cases. So, and I'll build my argument as, 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 as I go along. And uh, this, is where we, this is where we are. We look, located in, in Guildford. We are, one hour south of uh, London. Uh, the last two, they are, they're not wallpapers, they're real pictures, so just in case you're wondering. And, uh, and we are part of a consortium of four, of four hospitals, and we uh, handle samples from four different hospitals, and our annual workload for breast cancer cases is 2,000, 2,000 breast cancer cases. So how did we start testing for her to, uh, pre-2007, we, we used to send uh, all our her to, uh, cases to external laboratories. Uh, and uh, they would send the samples back to us, and, and it was expensive, uh, high turnaround time. And, uh, uh, and then in 2007, uh, we were asked to develop a, a, a new test, and we, we used uh, first Kitsch technology and then Sitch technology, <coughs> and because of all, our issues with turnaround times and, and, and costs. But this technology had also uh, has, has some issues as well. It was cheaper than fish, but, but it's still costly for, 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 a molecular, for a molecular test. And we had issues as well with repeat rates. And repeat rates, the issues that we had were mostly linked to, uh, to, 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 sample, uh, to sample handling problems uh, and fixation and so on. So it's a pre-analytical stage that was, that was the, more, the, the primary issue for, for these repeat rates. So, uh, and then digital PCR comes out and we start thinking, can we use that in this same context? Can we move forward the, the science a little bit? It, it, there are no guidelines available. This is a research use only a, a technique instrument. Can we do this? Can, can we move it a little bit further? And uh, so our research goal was to explore digital PCR as, as a, an alternative to a silver inside hybridization that we are already using in the lab. And I really like that wheel uh, from the CDC looks at three different uh, components, analytical, clinical, and clini clinical validity and clinical utility. And I was going to focus on, a f on f we don't have time to focus on everything, but we are just going to focus on a few of them. Assay design and concordance linked to analytical validity, threshold, and economic evaluation. So this, this is not going to be a full-blown economic evaluation, but it's just, just the cost per sample and how much money we can save in the lab. And the next slide, uh, Everyone is familiar with HER2, and I won't spend much time on this slide. And just to say that the HER2 is a very important, very important gene for, for us in, in, breast, in breast cancer. And the literature says that we should 20 percent of uh, invasive breast cancer cases should be uh, of expressing the, the protein, or, or you can find the amplification. 20 uh, percent of those breast cancer cases. So this next picture just shows one thing that um, that. Uh, it's, it's funny, I really like this picture because it summarizes uh, a lot of the science that we've been doing in the past, I don't know, 20 years maybe. And uh, in the very, very simple slide, how a proto-oncogene turns into an oncogene. And there's three main mechanisms there. And, it's, uh, and uh, I think it's beautifully explained and I'm not going to go over it. Uh, but what we're interested in here is on gene amplification. So, Moving on to the next slide, why do we test for HER2? We test for HER2 for, for primary reason is for drug eligibility. In the UK, we have a body that, that regulates all of this. And uh, actually, uh, the, I put the word that uh, predicted the double inverted commas for, for a very simple reason, because the models that we have today, they, uh, if you look at just the, 
a, a single gene models, they're not very good. We, we know that even if the, pat the patient is eligible for, for, the, for the drug, if it's positive, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And the reason for that is that you have a lot of other genes involved, involved there. So what, we try, what, what the community is trying to do, you know, all of us, that we're trying to do is to move from a sing single gene model to a multi-gene model, which is much more complex. And hopefully that, that, that this will help patients much more. And as, as a negative prognostic factor as well, as it, uh, you can see there the, the copy number, for example, um, you, have to, you have to, you know the negative patients, you, if you, have, if you have your Kaplan Meier curves, and the, if you look at the copy number there, if it's, if it's a low copy number, then, then the, the disease-free survival is, is, is higher than the, if you have a, a high copy number. How do we test uh, for HER2? There's currently there are two recommended methodologies. Uh, in situ hybridization, and this is the, probably the most used fish picture in the world. And uh, the second uh, technique is immunohistochemistry. chemistry. Right, and how can we tell from, from these two methodologies that something is positive or something is negative? So, there, there are some guidelines. I'm acutely aware that there, there are new guidelines that came out uh, last month, ASCO CAP guidelines for, for HER2 testing. Um, well, we've started a project with pre ASCO guidelines, so we, we data I'm presenting here is, is pre ASCO uh, the guidelines 2013, that is. So, uh, what we have here, uh, for example, we're looking at uh, 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 ratios, uh, and the new ASCO CAP guidelines now, they, they, they put, uh, more, more emphasis on, 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 um, on, the, on not so much on the, on the ratio, but rather on the copy, on the copy number or signal per cell. Uh, so, for example, here, uh, uh, if you want to call something positive, use, using the, the, the 2007 guidelines, then a, a 2.2 ratio, anything that's above two, a 2.2, then you call a positive immunity chemistry, three plus. But, what does that mean in digital PCR terms? We don't know. So we are not on and investigate. And again, why should we test, why should we do this? And is there, are, there are a lot of, uh, the premise of digital PCR is that, that you have technical improvements and you have cost savings as well. These are two main reasons why we went on and, and did this. And I'd like to draw your attention to uh, these last two here. So it's the, the um, Inter-observer vari variability, so much less subjective, uh, <laughs> looking at data on a screen than, than looking at a slide under the microscope. And uh, sample variability, we know that each in site hybridization is a very sensitive technique, much more sensitive than PCR for different reasons. And, and if, if we can, if, if we do the PCR, there, there's a le lot less uh, sample variability. And again, we got this cost, cost improvements as well. Uh, staff time, uh, reagent costs, and, and our repeat rate as well. So these are the premises of digital PCR. How, where do we start a project? We started with 48 uh, FFP breast samples, and they were up to three years old. As you can see, you have a core biopsy there, you, the, you have a surgical excision there as well. And uh, uh, we extracted DNA, and then we sent uh, DNA to, uh, to, to Life Technologies guys. And let's go back a little bit on that slide there. So what we're trying to do is, is uh, look at ratios, HER2 and HP ratios, uh, so that we can compare it to, to the gold standard, which, was, uh, which is fish. And, and uh, assay design, uh, very, very important. Is, uh, I got this, this, this picture from the Life Technology website. So what we were trying to do as well was we didn't want to redesign anything uh, uh, we just want to take what was available off the shelf and use that and see how that performed as well. So we, we picked up the HER2 target from our technologies and we picked up as well the RNA-SP. The main difference, as you can see, this is, this is in, a, in an intronic region there and the other one is you pick up, you're picking up an egg zone. So it might be an issue, uh, we'll see. So this is where we're called easy workflow. We just send samples, we got two results back. And uh, there's a table with all the results. Uh, and then we just, we just had to, to handle our, our data. Uh, and um, so what we're interested in here is, is our, cop, uh, our ratio here. Uh, so uh, if you 
plotted all our samples and, and the ratio on your y-axis as well. And this is what we got. And uh, these two lines here are, are the anything above that line uh, according to, uh, to each criteria you call it positive, anything below that line according to each criteria you call it negative. So, and anything in between those lines is, is, a, is, is a, an equivocal. So, did more data handling. Uh, we put all the samples in ascending order. Uh, so use the ratios. And now we have uh, to say the, the 1.2 to 0.2 ratio there. And the interesting thing now is that we, what we did next was to uh, all our positive samples by, uh, by, by each, we colored them in red, and uh, all our negative samples they were, were in, in blue. So um, at the outset, there's, there's two outliers there. There's a red dot there, I'm not sure if you can see it, and there's, there's another red dot there. So these are the two positive samples that are below the, the, the cutoff. The other thing we, we notice as well is that this cutoff might not, might not be the best cutoff to, the, to this interval, 1.8 to 2.2, because uh, we are, we're getting a lot of negatives below, the, below the, the, that range there. Uh, and we went on and, and investigated these two, two samples, and uh, this is another way of, of uh, showing our data. So you've got a sample number on top, you've got on the, on the second row, you've got your ratio, Third row, you got your your cis result, uh, and that's that's your uh, your interval. Anything in, inside the interval, you call it you call it equivocal. So we see already that, that there's a problem with with this with this interval here, and it's getting a lot of policy below the negative uh, cutoff point. And these are were the two samples we went on and investigated. So we got sample number thirty four. Uh, and sample number 22. So what we, what we did was um, we checked sample size and we double checked everything if we, if we had sent the right sample and repeated uh, the sample and we got the same result. And then uh, we asked if, they, if the, the reference gene could be changed. And the reference gene was changed uh, and realized actually the, that with different reference gene, you will get uh, a different ratio. 0.9. So RNSP, has it been deleted? In this case, has it not been deleted? Question mark. Uh, the other sample, sample num number 22, uh, we did exactly, the, went through exactly through the same process, and uh, we did it, and we couldn't find the, couldn't find the rans an answer to it. And uh, so we went back to the original sample, we extracted, we ran everything, and we actually looked at the slide and realized actually we had issued a, a wrong result. Uh, and, uh, and the reason for that was because there was poor hybridization in, in, in the normalizing gene C17. And fortunately enough, there was, were no consequences for the patient, uh, but we did get that result wrong by doing our traditional CISH technique, and we picked it up with visual PCR. And uh, so what we do, did we do next? So our, our plan moving forward is, is to uh, maybe extend that range, the equivocal range, as you can see, everything is in the LOH. We, we could call it a cubicle. Uh, so we get nicely the, uh, those two other ranges there. And, and anything above this, we call, it, we call it positive. Anything below this, we call it negative. And, and why do we want to do this uh, moving forward? Because we want to understand where, where the, in, the real interval lies. Uh, we know that with fish, uh, it's 1.8 to 2.2. With this PCI, we're still trying to understand what it is. And, f and again, sample number 34 after correction and after what we've done here falls in the negative range. The result becomes then concordant. And uh, sample 22 as well becomes concordant with this uh, between CISH and digital PCI. Uh, so again, it's just another way of, of, of uh, demonstrating our data. And Right, now in terms of numbers, you're looking, you're looking how, the, how, how, how this pans out in a in day-to-day lab life. So we tested 48, tested 48 samples. Uh, if you use that same algorithm to call samples equivocal, then 12 of them will be in the equivocal range, 20, which is 25% of our, of our samples. Four, 14 will be in the positive and 22 in the negative. 
What does this mean in practical terms? It means that if we were to move forward um, diagnostically, that we wouldn't need to, to test those samples for SISH. So 75% of our samples, we, we wouldn't need to, uh, to, to test them. We could use this as, as a first screen. And anything that comes in this equivocal range, we would reflex it back to SISH or immunohistochemistry. Uh, again, that's the working uh, PCR algorithm. Maybe include two reference genes as well. And now, uh, costs. This is a very interesting slide. Uh, um, so I got together with the histology guys and asked about costs and uh, how everything pans up. And uh, we're paying roughly 105, 105 pounds per sample. And that cost per sample includes the consultant's time and reagent costs and that admin costs as well. Uh, and uh, we have a 15% repeat rate and we do reflect things to IHC when needed. So our total cost uh, is 267,000 pounds per year that we're spending on, the, on, on this test uh, because, because we're using frontline-ish in our, in our lab. If we move on to frontline IHC, our costs uh, will, will, will are to 127,000 pounds. If we were to move to frontline uh, digital PCR, this will be our cost we're reflecting to ish and reflecting to, uh, to IHC. So considerable cost savings. And summary, it, this is another very interesting side because uh, uh, this is where we have ish. Uh, it's still expensive, um, variable specific, as it, it is the gold standard. You can argue that IHC will sit there if, uh, if, if sample processing is is done, is done proper, properly antigen retrieval and all the other things that the guys in Solgy do. And this PCI, I believe that it falls in that category. So reliable, specific, and is, is, is cost effective. Uh, and what does this mean in terms of uh, uh, US, US dollars for, for us, for our, for our experience? Uh, so just going to, uh, to the cost bit. So we could save, if we move to digital PCI, we could save between um, $95,000 to $363,000. It's not negligible for us. Uh, and uh, so that would be the, the clinical, um, clinical utility part, part of, the, uh, of the diagram that I showed in the beginning. So in terms of analytical validity, in terms of clinical validity as well, we have to be very careful with the reference genes that, that, we, that we pick because that, that, that is going to influence our results. And it seems to be much more sensitive than, than, uh, than our current uh, ish method. The reason why I say that is, is because, uh, uh, um, because of the, the cutoff that we're using uh, on, on, on fish or uh, ish, uh, 1.8 to 0.2 coughing is equivocal. So anything above 2.2. Here, we, our cutoffs will be much lower. And uh, what we want to do as well is to characterize percentage tumors, do an extensive work on percentage tumor. But so far, uh, so good. And uh, we would like to, to, to do a long-term parallel study with our current data. But we do believe that, that this is a very, very disruptive uh, technology, very disruptive innovation, and, and uh, everyone in the, in, in, the, in the lab will benefit from, uh, from the, I'm not being paid to say those things, but, this is the, but the cost savings are there for us. And, uh, and for us, this means that we can hire more staff with those cost savings, buy more, instrument, buy more instrumentation, and move forward. Um, and, uh, and, uh, more than happy to take any questions at this point.